Welcome back. This is the follow up for the previous video, part two, which we spoke a little bit about the intro to the phaser domain. In this video, we'll talk about the impedance of circuit elements. So you can see in the time domain, the impedance is C capacitance. And in the phaser domain, that is transformed to the following. And we have V for the inductor. So the impedance of a circuit element, so a circuit element, is the ratio of the phasor voltage to the phasor current flowing through that. So that will be the ratio of the phasor current and the phasor voltage. So the impedance of that element would equal to the ratio of the phasor voltage to the phasor current and that is measured in ohms. So we can then go ahead and start with the resistor. So the VI relationship for a resistor is equal to, or is V equal to I times R. And in the time domain, we have V of T is equal to I of T times R we can put the R to indicate the voltage across the resistor is equal to the current through the resistor times the resistor resistance. So from our previous video, if we can recall our expression for the, our expression that relates a positive cosine function is, so X of T is arbitrary. So that would be the real part so cosine, a positive cosine function would be the real part of the following. So this is from our previous video. So now we have X is arbitrary. So that means we can use X can be represented or take on the form of a voltage or current. So V in this case is going to equal to the real part of V and let's, that's across the, the resistor times the complex exponential e to the j omega t and that's equal to the current and we want the real part as well through the resistor times j omega e to the j omega t times resistance so we can then go ahead and factor those. And that's the real part. And that's the voltage across the resistor. And when I say factor, we move move the right hand side over to the left hand side, I should have said that. And then we get R times I e to the j omega t is equal to zero. So basically what we're saying is that the complex exponential e to the j phi cannot equal zero. Thus, by having that, we can then say the voltage across the resistance would e minus the resistance, the voltage across the resistor minus the resistor time the current through the resistor is equal to zero. And thus we can name our impedance or write our impedance as the voltage phasor voltage across that resistor divided by the phasor current through the resistor is equal to R. So here you can see the impedance of a resistor is R impedance oppose the current flow or impede the current flow. So a resistor impedance is entirely real and the VI relationship is the same in the time and phasor domain. So we can then go on to our capacitor. And in the time domain, the voltage across the, um, well, let's talk about the inductor first. So the voltage across uh, a inductor is related to 
the current through that inductor and the time domain let's just go over with you we can go ahead so the voltage across a inductor and the time domain is related to the current through that inductor and the time domain by the following expression we know that we're still using our complex expression which we get the voltage is going to equal the real part of the expression V times the complex exponential exponential e to the j omega t that's equal to L and if we take the derivative and watch the previous video we went through this already we take the derivative the operator is the real operator the real operator can be swapped with the the, um, the derivative which is v over dt the operator for the derivative thus when we take the derivative we can still probably include our real part j omega we take the derivative of a complex exponential in this case e to the j omega t we times that complex exponential times the expression excluding the variable for which we're taking the derivative so that is equal to keep our i times e to the j omega t we then go ahead and that simplifies to and if you want to you could say that cancel you could say this cancel and then you end up with V of L, the voltage across that inductor, times the inductance, times J omega, and the current through the inductor, which then our impedance is equal to the ratio of V divided by I, so that we end up with J omega times L. So the impedance for the inductor is L, and as you can see, the impedance is positive and imaginary. So if you think about our complex algebra review, when we had the Z in rectangle form, we had some, some number times the imaginary part. And in this case, our, our real part is zero. So that means the inductor is positive because our J is positive and imaginary. So we can then go ahead and we could say a little bit about the inductor, but we'll probably leave that before we start our problems in this video. So in the phasor domain, the inductor behaves like a short circuit at DC and like a open circuit at very high frequencies. So what we're saying is that because the impedance of the inductor L is proportional to the frequency, as the frequency increases, the impedance increases. So if the impedance increases and that inductor opposes the flow of current, that means if by the time the higher this get, the more position the inductor invokes to the current thus it will be like an open circuit and at low frequency current will be allowed to flow thus it will be like a wire and the lower the frequency and if the frequency is zero there will be no impedance because zero times anything is zero there will be no impedance so thus it will be like a short circuit so let's go ahead and just put that over here So the impedance is equal to J omega Z, J omega L. As the frequency increase, Z increases. And as Z increases, the inductor behaves like a short circuit. And as C decreases, the in so it's proportional. As the frequency decreases, the opposition to current decreases thus it behaves like a short circuit 
So now we can go on to the capacitor. So for our capacitor in the time domain, the voltage of the capacitor or the current through the capacitor is related to the voltage by this expression. And as always, we go ahead and write our expression down. And the current for this one omega t is equal to c v t of the voltage. So that would be the real part. Make a square bracket. As always, we can interchange our operators, integrate both sides, and then we end up with the following. So let's just kill these. And when we integrate, we're going to end up with the same complex exponential, so we can kill both of those. But, but let's say we integrate before we kill that, so let's, let's integrate before that. So we go ahead, integrate both sides, so we end up with omega t divided by the expression in the power of the exponent, excluding the variable for which we're integrating that, expo that exponential. And we'll end up over here, cancels out. So we end up with omega t. You can go ahead and kill both of those. So then we end up with the following. Which is 1 all over j omega times c. And this is purely imaginary. However, though, it will be negative and purely imaginary. So the impedance for the capacitor can be written as negative j over omega c because j is equal 1 over j is equal to minus j. So that means it's negative and purely imaginary. So as we did for the inductor, we can go ahead and do the same thing for the capacitor. So the inductor was proportional to the frequency. However, capacitor is inversely proportional. So it's one increase, one decrease. And So let's go ahead and start at the point of saying when the frequency decreases, so if it decreases to zero. And again, you would want to think about it as if the DC equivalent for the capacitor will be an open circuit. So, for the higher frequencies, and basically what I'm saying is that, <coughs> so as the frequency decreases, you'd have to look at it like, say that when the frequency increases, so look at when the, so look at it at a higher frequency first. And at higher frequency, the impedance for the capacitor decreases and thus allow more current to flow. So the greater we increase, so the frequency is going to dominate both of the other variables. So as the frequency increase at this point, Z decreases. 
so it approaches zero. However, though, you could look at it as if we have one in the numerator, and as the frequency increases at this point towards, so this would be zero. Basically, that's what we're saying. So if you divide, you divide something by a greater number, the denominator, it goes down to zero. But if this goes to zero, say approximately 0 0.01, because if it goes to zero, it's undefined. So we're saying that as the frequency decreases, so if it's at a DC level, this is then equal to infinity. So if it's equal to infinity, that means at DC, the capacitor is going to be an open circuit. And at AC, well, we should say high frequencies, as we just mentioned, that the higher this gets, the lower the impedance, because it's approaching zero, we have a short circuit. And the frequency response for the capacitor and the inductor and the resistor looks as follow. So we have a constant response for the resistor. And let's say that's the magnitude of the impedance. And that would be a constant line. And we have frequency and the magnitude. So for a inductor, we have an increase. And that increase is omega L. For the resistor, it's R. And then for the capacitor, we have a exponential decrease. And that would be 1 over omega C. So I probably should have, this should have been in black. So that's in black, then we have blue for L. And then we have red for capacitor. So we can then go ahead and work on a few problems to demonstrate the concept from, you know, the previous videos of our sinusoidal signals and our review of complex algebra in the phasor domain. So for these problems, our examples, we're going to use, we're going to determine the phasor domain counterparts of the following signals. So let's say we have the signal V of T and that's equal to a amplitude of 10 cosine two times E, or you could say two times 10 to the four, but two times 10 to the four, plus an angle of 53 degrees. And we want to determine the phasor domain counterpart of that following signal. So based on our sinusoidal analysis videos that we've went through in the previous videos, we know that this is already in our positive cosine form the amplitude is positive and it's cosine and we adapt the cosine form. So all we have to do now is use our properties or the relationship between time domain and phasor domain. So in this case, we'll end up with a magnitude of 10 and that will be times of the complex exponential e to the j with, an, with a phi or a theta of 53 degrees. And by our shorthand notation, we can write that as a magnitude of 10 with an angle of 53 degrees. So what if we go ahead and we had a signal V of T is equal to the negative, let's make, let's say negative six sine three E to the three times T minus 15 degrees, it's in volts. As you can see from our sinusoidal analysis and our trig identity, we want to express this as a cosine 
function, a positive cosine function at that. And you can do this by making this a cosine and then making it positive. But I'll just go ahead and turn it into a positive sign and then into a cosine. So we use the identities. Sine of x is equal to minus sine of x plus or minus 90, 180 degrees. And then we're going to use cosine of x equal plus or minus sine of x plus or minus 90 degrees. So with that said, we can then go ahead and add 180. 180. Here we have a minus angle. So we'd want to add 180. If we had a positive angle, we would minus. So then we go ahead. This is going to turn into a positive sign. Take three times T. And this is going to equal to 165 degrees when we add our 180 to that. Then from that, we use our second identity, the cosine. This then equals to 6 cosine. Keep our omega t, which is equal to e to the 3, 3,000 times t. And then we then go ahead and so we have a positive 165. However, though, in this case, positive sign. So we subtract 90. So that's going to equal to one positive 75 degrees. It's in volts. So then we have our positive cosine form. We can just express that in the phasor counterparts, phasor domain counterpart. And that's going to equal to a complex exponential of e to the j 75 degrees, which in our shorthand notation, we can go ahead and express that as a magnitude of 75 and an ang a magnitude of 6 and an angle of 75 degrees. So those are fairly, fairly simple. But let's look at our inductor. And we're going to start this one from our basic expression. So let's go ahead before that. Let's go up and see if we went over the inductor. We did. We did. So here we went over the inductor and we went over the capacitor. But let's say we didn't go over it. And we had a inductance of 0 0.4 millionary at a frequency of 1 kilohertz. We know that the expression that relates the voltage of the inductor is as follow. We know that the real part of that, if we go up to our inductor, we know that we'll follow through with our appropriate derivation and then we end up with our impedance which we, we know is j omega l we know that omega is not in is radian per second and here we have frequency so we know that our angular frequency omega is equal to 2 pi times free times whatever given frequency. So thus we go ahead and we calculate that and we can write two pi times e to the three, which is one one K times point four or zero point four and in milli and this comes out to be and we have to write that two point five one three three rounded so that is our answer for z so that's determining the phasor counterpart of our inductor we can then go ahead and tackle the capacitor so say we have a capacitance 
that's equal to 2 microfarad at 1 megahertz. We know the expression in the time domain that relates the current to the voltage. And we know based off our previous example, we'll get the following impedance. So we can then go ahead and calculate that. So that's going to be minus J one all over, and we know angular frequency as we just written down is equal to two pi times frequency. So that would be two pi. And that is in, in our case, one mega. So I can write that to E times six and two microfarad e to the negative six. And that comes down to J zero point seven nine five and I should have write home okay I written homes up top and that is our impedance for our capacitor and inductor. So if we should have drawn a circuit in the time domain, so in the time domain we would have the following circuit. So some source or whatever it is we know that a capacitance in this circuit was two microfarad and the inductance was 0 0.4, I think, 0 0.4 millionary, 0 0.4 millionary. So we then go ahead to the phaser, and both are equivalent. We now end up with Point five one three three ohms and ZXC is equal to minus zero point zero seven. So with L well ZXC, the impedance of the capacitor is equal to minus J zero point zero seven nine five and that's in ohms. And Basically, uh, that's it. So in the next series of videos, we'll start with our phaser analysis. Basically, here we have what we would be doing in phaser analysis. If we had like a source, we would then convert that into a phaser counterpart. And then we'll solve for, say, the voltage across this capacitor and then express it in the time domain and that would be our voltage for some problem so we'll then go ahead and give a brief intro as in like how kvl and so forth is is represent will still usable or is equally applicable in the phaser domain and we will talk about the adoption of our cosine reference and the transform circuit to phaser domain and uh, KCL and KVL equations in the phaser domain. And uh, yeah, so the next series of video will go over that. So I'll see you in the next one. Bye.